As we uh, said earlier uh, yesterday, uh, this month is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 7, and uh, in two months in December will be uh, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 8, and then uh, two months later will be Apollo 9, Apollo 10, Apollo 11 next year. So I think it's quite appropriate that uh, we uh, have this panel to uh, discuss Apollo and its implications and what it really meant for the country and what it meant for the world and uh, how it was done and the lessons that we could learn. And uh, we, uh, I think, have a very distinguished panel up here. Uh, we have uh, Jerry Griffin, who was uh, a flight director, a lead flight director on Apollo 12 and uh, 15 and 17 and was involved in all the other Apollo missions as well, as well as Gemini. And uh, he went on to become the deputy director of the Kennedy Space Center and also the Flight Research Center out in California and uh, was the center director of the Johnson Space Center here in Houston. So uh, he's had a, a great background in the space program and certainly working as a flight controller and as a flight director on Apollo missions. Uh, Bill Carpentier uh, is a flight surgeon who came to NASA in 1965 and was involved in uh, Gemini and Apollo and, and uh, he has, uh, uh, of course, become well known as the Apollo 11 flight surgeon. And uh, Walt uh, Cunningham, uh, you uh, I think had the opportunity to listen to Walt last night. He gave an excellent presentation and uh, you saw the, uh, the mission film on Apollo 7. He's the last of I remember of that, uh, that crew. And uh, as we said last night, that mission was really the, the pivotal mission and it, it really uh, started us on the, on the road for the successes we saw with Apollo 8 two months later and then Apollo 9 uh, two months later and then 10 in May of 1969 and then the Apollo landing in July. And uh, also, uh, Fred Hayes was uh, involved yesterday here at the uh, summit. Fred, uh, of course, served as a lunar module pilot on Apollo 13. Uh, he was also on the backup uh, crew for Apollo 8 and Apollo 11, and also was a backup commander for Apollo 16. And if we had flown Apollo 19, uh, it was going to be the commander of that flight. Uh, he had a great background uh, as a research pilot, uh, at the Flight Research Center out in California and at uh, the Lewis Center, as it was called then, in Cleveland. Uh, flew as a Marine Corps pilot. Also flew with the Air Force. So before his selection in 1966, uh, he had a, a really a tremendous background in flight testing and aviation. Uh, graduate uh, of the University of Oklahoma and uh, was in the Oklahoma Air National Guard as well in the Ohio National Guard. And uh, Milt Heflin, uh, Milt was uh, involved in uh, the recovery operations, which was a significant part of our activities on Apollo. And uh, he was involved in the uh, recovery of Apollo 8, 10, 16, and 17. And uh, then went on to become a flight controller, a flight director, the head of the flight director's office, and then the associate director at the Johnson Space Center and uh, retired after a 46, 46 year uh, career in NASA. So let me turn it over to uh, Jerry and uh, I think it should be an interesting panel. Thank you very much, George. Uh, uh, this is going to be a change of pace from uh, the last panel for sure when uh, Cave Rubin started talking about genomes, Walt Cunningham leaned over to me and said, can you imagine an astronaut 50 years ago smart enough to even talk about it? And, uh, and, and that was true. That's what he said, and I agreed with him. Cause, uh, um, <laughs> so we're going to take a step back here, and, and uh, we're going to bring some uh, aerospace medicine into it. In fact, we're going to start with that. Um, but we're also going to talk about some of the meaningful things that I think we got out of Apollo and some of the, perhaps some of the funnier and lighter p 
pieces of it as well as uh, uh, some of the more serious pieces. Um, as George mentioned, uh, 50 years ago this month, we flew seven, and um, Apollo 7, and then we're going to take them off here pretty fast, and, and even in 2020 in April, uh, Fred Hayes' uh, Apollo 13 mission will be reaching his 50, <clears throat> excuse me, 50th birthday. So we've got a lot going on here. I, I know, I've, I think all of these guys would agree with me. I, I never thought 50 years ago that we would be standing here talking about it, um, what we did in, in those Apollo years. Uh, and, and it's interesting how it, the public has reacted to it. And uh, I know my calendar is full, uh, both here and overseas, uh, to talk to people about the Apollo program. Um, we learned a lot in Apollo. Um, <clears throat> it was pretty, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty rudimentary uh, time for us. It was a very complicated thing for us to do, and and people kind of, in fact, we poke fun today at, at at some of the technology that we got to the moon with, but it was all we had, and it was state of the art uh, at that time. So we didn't know anything better was coming down the line. Um, but we did learn a lot in those early years about um, the astronaut and, and their ability to perform. Uh, we ran into some medical problems uh, throughout the thing, uh, one kind or another, a lot of dealing with space motion sickness, and, and we had some interesting heart uh, by Gemini rhythms, particularly I remember I learned more about the heart than I cared to know on Apollo 15 uh, from that. And, uh, but, but we laid the groundwork, I think, for now with the better technologies and, and what we're seeing, I think, to go on and take it to the next level. It's already gone to the next level. But I thought it'd be interesting to start. Uh, Bill uh, <clears throat> was our, is our only guy here with a medical background. And so I'm gonna ask you to start, if you would, I know you've got a project going on. You just told me about it, and we'd like to hear about that. So, Bill, have at it. Okay. Now, as I said yesterday, um, my main job during the Gemini program involved doing pre-flight and post-flight recovery uh, medical evaluations. And so by the end of the Gemini program, I had accumulated significant experience in doing these evaluations, and I was given a job to try to develop a plan for pre-flight and post-flight medical evaluations for the Apollo program. Now, there were opinion ex opinions expressed around the center that you know, the Gemini program had already demonstrated that astronauts could tolerate a 14-day mission, and this was longer than a lunar land, a plant longer generation than was being planned for a uh, lunar landing operation, and so therefore we didn't need to collect any further medical uh, testing. However, there were many of us who believed that although we had learned a great deal during the Mercury and Gemini programs, there were still very important gaps in our knowledge. So we worked with the Apollo program office and were able to develop three medical objectives that were accepted. And these were to ensure crew health and safety from a medical standpoint, prevent back contamination from the lunar surface, but three, importantly, to continue to further the understanding of the biomedical changes that were incident to spaceflight. Now, I was assigned to be the crew flight surgeon for the first uh, Apollo flight, Apollo 7. So I worked closely with the other flight surgeons in the operations division and with the investigators in the research division to try to develop a program that would give us the additional information that we needed and still be accepted to, by the Apollo crew members. And the evaluations we decided upon involved six areas clinical evaluations, <coughs> microbiological evaluations, clinical hematology and biochemistry, red cell mass and plasma volume, bone mineral changes, cardiovascular evaluations that cl included uh, looking at orthostatic intolerance with lower body negative pressure, or LBNP, and uh, exercise response testing using a bicycle ergometer. 
Now before we presented this program to the crew, I had every test done on me two to three times. We, test, we timed every test multiple times so that we could determine the most reliable and fastest way we could get the most accurate information. But when we presented this program to the crew, it was not accept accepted with a great <laughs> deal of enthusiasm. <laughs> However, after considerable discussions uh, uh, outlining the information we really needed to <coughs> fill in the missing <coughs> gaps and outlining the consequences of not having this information and assuring them that we would complete every evaluation in two and a half to three hours, they did agree to proceed. And we were able to get three baseline evaluations in the month before the flight and post-flight evaluations were done immediately after recovery on the carrier and then on the day after recovery. And so most of these studies were repeated on a similar schedule for, the, for eight of the 10 remaining Apollo flights. So later I was assigned to be the crew flight surgeon for the first lunar landing mission. So I had to work out a program that I could do by myself inside the mobile quarantine facility or MQF with uh, help of, of, with the investigators on the outside of the MQF recording the information. Now there was not enough room in the uh, mobile quarantine trailer to have an LPNP device so I had to come up with an alternative and the only thing I could come up with is lying the crew member on the dining table for five minutes and then standing him up for five minutes to get some idea of orthostatic tolerance. I managed to take out one of the seats in the mobile quarantine facility and put in a bicycle ergometer so we could get some a basic exercise uh, response test done. I was able to learn all of to acquire and learn how to process all of the blood samples for further analysis back in, analysis back in the re Lunar Receiving Laboratory back in Houston. It was easy for me to get all of the microbiology samples in the spacecraft on, on every crew member. And I also uh, took a course in nuclear physics and nuclear medicine so that I could be then qualified to use the radiopharmaceuticals that were required to continue looking at, at uh, blood volume studies. So uh, we managed to get a really good set of medical data uh, pre-flight and post-flight during the Apollo program. So what were we able to learn? We further validated the findings that were documented during the Gemini and the uh, Mercury programs, but we also obtained significant new information on the physiological changes that were occurring, the possible <clears throat> causes and what might be done to prevent the adverse findings. And so it appears to me that looking back over the Apollo data, there, the changes that were occurring in orthostatic tolerance and exercise capacity appeared to be largely preventable. And so what were these pre prevention, <laughs> what prevention could you use? And there's two things that I would recommend to anybody that was going to fly on a short-term flight, and that is get into shape pre-flight. And this is defined as having a pre-flight oxygen consumption of 30 to 35 cc's per kilo per minute at a heart rate of 160. And two, then having an in-flight daily intake of 30 to 35 kilocalories uh, per body weight per day of an Apollo type diet with the comparable fluid and electrolyte intake per day. Thanks. Uh, thank you, oh, Bill. Uh, oh, oh, Bill. Bill forgot to mention uh, the finest thing that he did for Apollo 7. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> when we splashed down of course, if you've seen the films and everything, you end up getting picked up, and it's uh, helicopters picking you up, and uh, got inside the helicopter, and I can't remember if I was the first one or the second one that came up on that, but the, when we got in there, Bill had a little a drink. We had an alcohol drink for the first time in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> And we were both surprised, shocked, and we loved it. <laughs> it, it was medicinal. It was strictly yeah, medicinal. It was. It, 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 was, it was medicinal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Walt, you uh, you were selected in the third uh, cycle of astronauts, and uh, and you got to remember, in those days, all of the astronauts were fighter pilots, and and until uh, we got to Jack Smith on 17, and he went through the training after he was selected. But all these guys were fighter pilots. I had been in a fighter squadron myself, and of course, flight surgeon meant to us. He's going to try to ground me. As soon as you walk in, that was your mentality. That uh, Now, I think probably Chuck Berry did more in his leadership time when he was running uh, medicine for, for us uh, in Apollo, trying to keep astronauts ready to fly. But the perception was still there. When you came in in 63, um, Walt, what, what was your first impression of the process a but then you had to go through a, a even more uh, medical stuff and other stuff but just give us a sense of what 1963 uh, was like entering well actually i don't remember any real problems after entering although i would say that uh, psychologically we were all very kind of tightened up up there to make sure that they wouldn't find something wrong with us. And uh, I guess I, I couldn't tell you what everybody does, but I, I think there's a certain amount of defensive uh, actions that you might take on it. But I, when I re reported out there, what I was, the first thing I was impressed of being a, a fighter pilot was they still had some nice airplanes, still had some F-102s, and uh, then the T-38s. I mean, we had, in my opinion, the, probably the, greatest flying uh, opportunities around that I've, that I've ever seen. For example, getting ready for uh, uh, Apollo 7, actually getting ready for the first flight. It went through some of the different steps. But uh, we spent a lot of time working with the uh, contractor out here in, in the, uh, out in California. And to this day, it's hard for people to understand and realize that that spacecraft was still not only under construction, but it was also in the design stage in many areas. They were trying to make uh, changes and things like that. So I, I can remember that uh, I think one one year there, I got about 400 hours flying, maybe a little bit more. But the thing that was so nice is the T-38 was, was so handy for us. Uh, we were flying some things we were doing on a T-38, they probably j just as uh, good and legal as y you're giving us those drinks on the, on the <laughs> in the chopper. But what people have a hard time to understanding, when they look back now, they think of, well, they had the first missions, et cetera. What's hard for them to understand is that was the third crew assignment that we had. We had been on a, a crew assignment that uh, got the crew got canceled after eight months. Uh, then the next one we were on for three months, and the crew died in the fire on the pad. And then we started uh, for our own particular assignment and crew. Finally, we were back in in the first place again. But 21 months of everybody, everybody that worked on that was totally dedicated to getting us into the air. And whether they like to think about it now or not, we were all well aware of the uh, limitations coming up on uh, how to beat the Russians to the moon. It was, uh, he didn't go spend a lot of time talking about it, but we knew our time was running out in that decade. So we, everybody worked hard on it. Uh, the things that over, they overcome uh, would be hard to go into uh, item by item, but they did a marvelous job getting us off the ground. You know, that brings up a good point. Um, you mentioned the fire. Uh, when the fire occurred and we lost the three crewmen on the pad, uh, of course, it stopped us in our tracks. Uh, in fact, it was during that period, that 21 months that Walt's talking about before we flew again, that I was named to be a flight director, and my first flight as a flight director was Apollo 7. Um, I think Apollo 7 has never gotten the attention that it needs, and I know Walt won't say it because he's so uh, shy uh, and underspoken, but uh, 
7 was a very, very critical mission. Had it not worked, uh, I'm not sure what would have happened to our lunar program, but it would probably would have stopped. Um, and uh, even without a fatality, if, if we just had to uh, abort the launch or abort early in orbit, um, but the flight was picture perfect. Um, they, they actually accomplished more objectives than we had laid out before the flight started. In fact, we kept asking them to add things, uh, which got the ire of the commander uh, more than once. And uh, <laughs> I think all... he, I think he only was able to reject one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we had it was a very interesting flight, and the and I remember um, how great it was when they stepped on the deck of the carrier. Then we knew we had a chance uh, to go on and land on the moon. So it was a critical, critical mission. And um, had it not been, uh, as I say, had it not been completed successfully, we probably would have ended our program. I, I think we would have. Yeah, I might mention one thing. You just heard people talking here at the last panel here about zero gravity and, and things like that. Uh, the main memory that I have, zero gravity was a piece of cake for us, really. Nobody was sick or anything like that. But I'll never forget when we got on board the carrier and uh, after waving to people, we end up in the, one of the cabins down there starting the, the medical checkout. And I will never forget, I laid down on a table. And there's a ceiling right up here. And I, the thought that I had was, I can't just push off and go up, go up to the ceiling. <laughs> I, I'll never forget that reaction. Yeah. Jane Cernan told me once that uh, he had a delayed reaction. He actually was was uh, brushing his teeth, I think, uh -huh. and he put he was at home or maybe at NASA, I don't know, but he put put toothpaste on his on his uh, toothbrush and then just dropped the <laughs> he dropped the toothpaste <laughs> and he said, "Why did that fall to the floor?" And then he then he realized he wasn't in, in uh, sounds zero like G you. anymore. So it's kind of funny. I don't know. If does that happen to everybody? You just have a hard time uh, adapting. Uh, Fred, you were in the fourth class. Uh, I think John Young uh, called you the original 19 um, in your class. 66, was it? 1966. Um, talk a little bit about how you entered and got into, and then we're going to talk later a little bit about Apollo 13, of course, but I just want to, how'd you get started? Uh, coming into the program, actually th thinking back to the fiscal, uh, it really seemed pretty easy. Uh, when I was at Flight Research Center, where I moved from now named Armstrong after Neil, uh, NASA had an agreement where every year we were sent to Loveless Clinic for a whole week of uh, some of them pretty weird. Uh, soak your hand in cold water till you got up to 180, 190 heartbeat. We had one fellow we called Dr. Zorba. It was a TV show with this fellow, Dr. Zorba. It kind of looked like him. And he'd put you in a chair and they had, uh, you had buttons and a big red light and a push, a foot thing to push on. And he'd flash uh, four combination letters and numbers and you had to remember at least two sets. And quickly, when the third one came up, you'd say the one, two, back. And you had to go through this sequence while clicking your fingers to turn out lights. And when the sound came on, you'd push your foot pedal. So, you know, there's that, some fairly strange things way beyond what the uh, astronaut uh, physical was as part of the uh, getting into the program. Uh, so, it, and like I said, it seemed pretty uh, benign when I went through the astronaut physical. The, uh, the thing about uh, leaving flight, it was interesting. Uh, uh, Neil Armstrong was about two and a half years ahead of me. He went through, uh, joined NASA at Lewis uh, in Cleveland, then went to a Flight Research Center and had come into the program. And uh, I called Neil after he had got down to uh, Manned Spacecraft Center at that time, and uh, asked him how, what, how were things in the astronaut program. 
Uh, Neil's uh, answer to me was, you sit in a lot, a lot of meetings. Uh, you sit, you spend a lot, a lot of time in a simulator, and it's not much good flying. So I, I really had to think hard uh, in applying because I was at flight. I was normally involved in a, three test programs at the same time, uh, supporting still X-15 flights in various ways. Uh, flying uh, an average every month, generally five or six types of aircraft. So I had to think hard about uh, applying. And uh, of course, the thing that uh, finally made me decide I should join up is the thought of getting to go to the moon. Because uh, that wasn't going to happen if I stayed at uh, Edwards. So what were your, what were your career assignments before, um, I think, George went through them a little bit, but remind us, what were you doing before you got assigned to 13 and it actually flew? Yeah, well, that actually happened uh, by happenstance. Uh, Mike Collins had an injury. I think it's a neck injury. Neck injury. Yeah. And uh, he got pulled off his assignment, and Lovell, I think, moved up to the Apollo 8 Prime crew at the time. And that left a gap uh, there, and I was assigned uh, by Deke to the Apollo 8 backup crew. The backup crew was Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and myself, and which is great. I mean, you, you, as soon as you can get a crew assignment, that's great, because that kind of puts you in the, Put the lineup in. of things. Uh, Ed Mitchell, actually, in our group had been assigned first. He was on the backup of Apollo 10. And so anyway, it was, it was a tough assignment. Actually, it was the toughest training assignment I went through because my primary job when I uh, uh, sort of a sideline of the duties as assigned when I got the first assignment was to Jim McDivitt. And Jim uh, gave, Ed Mitchell and I actually, who also was given that assignment, he just told us simply, uh, I want you to go to Grumman and make sure I got a good limb, lunar module. So Ed and I uh, went up to Grumman and spent seven months out of one nine months in the plant testing lunar modules during that period. Uh, test operation was uh, everything in program was schedule driven, highly schedule driven. Uh, test operations uh, at Grumman in 1967 ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It shut down one day of the year, Christmas Day. So otherwise, it was, that's the way it was. I'm sure it was that way at Rockwell, uh, trying to get things done and meet schedule. Yeah, one one uh, year, I spent 275 days in the air or on the site at the contractor. We were helping develop the vehicle, not just test it. And, uh, but anyway, Ed got, got off on the first the time he beat me, and uh, I, then I got the, the Apollo 8 assignment. Uh, Mike uh, got well and uh, came back into the rotation, and he had seniority. So I got to fly a uh, uh, train in another uh, backup assignment. I was a backup then on Apollo 11 with Jim and uh, Ken Mattingly, uh, which normally would have put us we only cycle three missions, so we normally would have flown 14. Uh, but uh, because of the uh, shifting of the crews, uh, Apollo 10, uh, Gordon Cooper and Don Isley had left the program, so Ed Mitchell was the only one that had gone through a full training cycle in the backup. So uh, Al Shepard and Stu Russell were assigned for that uh, mission. And somebody, I think, uh, uh, at headquarters and Deke decided they should get more training time. So uh, Jim Lovell was asked, uh, would you want to fly early and fly uh, 13? So we actually uh, got to fly a mission earlier than we normally uh, would have. Uh, we'll come back to 13 in a minute, but uh, I'm going to interject a little comment on my own here right now because we don't have anybody from Apollo 8 uh, with us today and I wanted to say kind of like 7, 8 was a critical step for for uh, the Apollo program. Um, 
And the interesting thing about eight is we had never launched uh, humans on a Saturn V rocket. So the first time we strapped three guys on top of that humongous rocket, we sent them to the moon, uh, which if you talk about a gutsy call by the leadership of the agency, um, it, it was that. What a lot of people don't remember or maybe even know is that the last unmanned test right before that mission was, we called it AS-502, Apollo Saturn 502, um, was unmanned and had a tremendous set of problems in the Saturn rocket itself. Had Pogo in the first stage, that's where the engine was pulsing. Um, there was a uh, fuel line that, that actually broke uh, in the second stage, I think it was. And then uh, in the third stage, didn't relight. It finally kicked it off, but it didn't light. So the, the Saturn rocket had a tremendous problem, but the guys at the Marshall Space Flight Center, who were phenomenal, they were really good, um, put all the fixes in, they tested them exhaustively on the ground, and they told George Lowe and others that they were convinced they had them fixed. And based on that ground testing, uh, we launched, and everybody knows that Apollo 8 was successful, orbited the moon 50 years ago in December of this year. So it was a tremendous step for us. Um, I can remember at the end of that mission thinking, we're going to make it to the moon now for sure to land. But anyway, I just wanted to make that comment on, on 8, very important part, uh, and you can't get past that to talk about the 50th. Uh, anniversary of Apollo. Uh, Milt Heflin. Um, no, that you should say, go flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Milt, uh, Milt was in landing in recovery. We, we heard that earlier. Vital piece of the um, of the puzzle in Apollo, as it will be uh, in any program. We've gotten used to the shuttle uh, landing back on, uh, on Earth in, in an airplane, essentially a glider. Um, but landing in the ocean, uh, all over the oceans, uh, was an interesting uh, procedure. And a lot of people always think about the, the role that NASA played. I tell you what, we could not have done Apollo without the military. We had the Navy in the landing and recovery business. We had the Air Force in tracking, uh, actually calm and tracking airplanes, uh, the Araya, uh, it was called. It was a big antenna. And then we had the ground stations. Uh, many of them were military uh, in their beginning and were adapted to our mission. So we had, and we also had a bunch of military people in with us, guys like Rocco Patron. And, and um, that, that helped us uh, get started. The facilities at the Cape were almost totally built by the Army Corps of Engineers. So it was a real concentrated effort of the whole country and all the branches of government. So landing and recovery was a great example of that. It was not easy. It was uh, distant places. Milt, Tell us about that. Milt later became a shuttle flight director, so he's lived in both worlds. Um, but tell us about the landing and recovery activities of the <coughs> Apollo era. Okay. Um, first of all, let me talk about, uh, I think Apollo 8 was the gutsiest thing this nation has ever done in manned space flight. Um, and for all the reasons that you said. Uh, I'm used to being last and everything. Uh, <laughs> recovery was kind of at, well, it was at the end of the mission. And Jerry, I want to I want to uh, publicly thank you and, and the flight directors and, and the team for um, at least waiting until the crew stepped off the hel helicopters before you lit up the cigars. Uh, now, that's when my job was really beginning, as, yeah. it, as it turns out. Um, I have not served in, in this country's military, but I was blessed to have had a job from 1966 to 1975 
um, working very closely with men and women in our armed services, primarily the Navy, the Air Force, Marines. And uh, I learned a lot from that. Um, I learned command and control. I learned dedication. And, and so I was blessed to have been able to, uh, to do that. Uh, and this is what you said there, Jerry. I want to read, oh, before I forget it. Since we typically are, are kind of a last thought, um, I want you to write this down. Uh, I want you to put this in your browser. And this is what I want you to write down and go look in your browser. All one word, Landing and Recovery Division, <coughs> Landing and Recovery Division dot org. And you will find, that's our website, and you will find many stories, many pictures, many videos, some with sound, uh, about the Gemini and the Apollo recovery uh, business. Uh, on that website is a very short story I want to read. It's not going to take much time, but it fits right with what you said about our relationship with the Department of Defense. And this... Uh, and, and this is a short story that was written by John Stonecipher, who was one of the uh, uh, leaders, uh, team lead on board the uh, uh, recovery ships. Admiral John McCain was extremely significant related to our Pacific recoveries during Apollo. He was <clears throat> Sink Pack, which was Commander in Chief Pacific. 1968 to 1972, in charge of all support in the Pacific which included Vietnam. Of course, this, a lot of this occurred during that period, as you all know. It is important that most of the NASA ship support was drawn from Vietnam assignments. My favorite story, John Stonecipher's favorite story, is as we approached Apollo 8, scheduled over Christmas in 1968, Chris Kraft and the U.S. Air Force Generals of DDMS, which was the Department of Defense Man Space Flight Support mm -hmm. Office that we interfaced with directly to get all that support, uh, run by a two-star general. Uh, Kraft, the, they, they were concerned about asking for support in the Pacific, especially during this time. Um, and most of these ships, um, um, typically would be scheduled to be, be someplace else on Christmas. Uh, Dr. Kraft um, was asked to go talk to the four-star Admiral uh, McLean, and so he flew to Hawaii. He briefed Admiral McCain and his audience of admirals and generals about our requirements. When that was done, McCain turned to the attendees um, all that high power setting in that, uh, in that conference room. McCain turned to the attendees and said, great briefing, give this man what he wants. Uh, and during that time, so you think about that. So that's perfect. I'm glad you asked about that. That's uh, the support that we had. We couldn't even come close to doing that. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a little part-time consulting job, and on Tuesday I'll be on the USS John P. Murtha. It's a landing platform dock, got a well deck in it. I'll be leaving San Diego with the other landing recovery group now from the Kennedy Space Center. So when I re retired, I uh, got on a small contract to, uh, uh, to be with them and uh, observe their operation. This will be my third trip with this team. Uh, it's called an underway recovery test. Uh, I, I served on one of those before the unmanned Orion flight, and then I was on board the USS Anchorage on the splashdown of Orion in December uh, 2014. And I had a lot of fun with that, as you can imagine. It's a hoot for me, by the way. It's a deja vu all over again, as, as we know uh, Yogi Berra used to say. Uh, when I left the team uh, after that time, um, in uh, December 2014, um, I told him, this is my ninth splashdown, and I'm still eight ahead of you, and I hope you can catch up. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill, what about the, um, you spent a lot of time on ships. I think you did on Apollo 11, uh, and you did the quarantine facility, which we did for 11 and 12. 
and I guess we ended after 12. We, you know, did we quarantine them on 14? I can remember. Okay. Well, talk a little about the quarantine process. Uh, that's probably ancient history to most people now, but that was uh, interesting. Well, because I guess as everybody knows, it was decided that there would be a quarantine period after coming back from the moon in case there was any pathogens that were brought back that were, uh, were unexpected. And again, you know, this was, expect this was a very, very low probability because it's hard to, to imagine that life could exist under, the, under those conditions, but there was nobody that would say it's zero. So it was mandated that there would be a quarantine period, and how would it be done? You know, and so all of the things that had to be worked out. And so there's a, a lot of going back and forth and back and forth. The original plan was to bring the spacecraft on board the, the recovery carrier and then hook it to the MQF with a tunnel so that they would come right from the spacecraft in. But then there was all kinds of problems that developed with the crane and with the, the connections to the spacecraft. And if there was high seas, they couldn't you know, guarantee that they would even be able to lift the spacecraft onto the carrier. So then the rules changed and uh, they were going to be taken out of the spacecraft, put into bi or have biological isolation garments put into the spacecraft, you know, get suited up and then decontaminated and then brought back on, on, uh, via the carrier where, where I would meet them. But so that, that was the, the, the program so that there was going to be three quarantine flights, um, Apollo 11, 12, and 13. 13 didn't land on the moon, so then they put... <laughs> you, got, you got diverted. <laughs> the third quarantine flight to, to Apollo 14, which then I, I did that, that flight also, so that, uh, uh, you know, as, and as everybody knows, there was nothing brought back from the moon. The surface of the moon is essentially a, a, a nothing. It just, it's just uh, particles, <laughs> but no... no uh, alive particles. Yeah, and when they got back to GSC, they were quarantined there. I was lead flight director on Apollo 12, and of course I wanted to get to the crew as quickly as I could, so I had to go over to the quarantine lab on site, and I talked to Conrad and Gordon and Bean through glass. You know, it was like they were in prison. That's why I talked. I said, now you're getting ready for your future life. I know what you're going to do. And uh, <laughs> But it was kind of an issue, and then uh, we got past that, and uh, let me, um, after eight, we did nine and ten, two more critical steps. Uh, we're going to celebrate those 50s early next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, in July, uh, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 and, and the landing, first landing. Um, I'm going to not spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we're going to get a lot of, you're going to hear about that whether you want to or not over the next uh, six, eight months. Um, we're going to all hear a lot about Apollo 11 and its dessert. Um, but I wanted to get on past that so that on 12 we actually uh, had a very successful mission um, except for lightning on liftoff which I was the flight director for again. and. Um, and it got our attention, but we got it squared away. It knocked everything else uh, out of the uh, command module. It was pretty well offline. Uh, the lightning had disconnected the fuel cells, and it took us a while to figure that out. Jerry, if you, yeah. I like to I like to say that 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 was I I don't know of a more difficult, greatest call in history uh, during during launch. Uh, between you guys, all you guys on we, that. We almost list. aborted, and I, I remember thinking, you're right, um, uh, the Gessier call was to go on to the moon after we got into orbit. Thank goodness the Saturn V booster was under control, and the lightning had not affected its computer. It was called the instrument unit, which was a computer, um, and then the command module guidance system was a backup. And um, I remember the first thing I looked at was the V gamma plot, which is a plot of flight path angle versus velocity that we kept on the big board in front, and it was right on target. I mean, we were going right uphill, and my first thought of don't abort too early, you know, get some altitude so that got more time for the escape system to work and the parachutes to deploy. Now, that'll happen in a 
about a second or two. And then John Aaron made a call, uh, an ECOM made a call uh, that after we figured out we had never used the switch before, it was right in front of Al Bean, um, called SCE, Signal Conditioning Equipment. Uh, John said, have him try SCE to AUX. And after a, some funny conversation between us and Conrad, uh, first thing Conrad said when we said SCE to AUX, he said, what the hell is that? And, uh, but anyway, Bean knew where the switch was and flipped it. We got our data back, we could see the fuel cells disconnected. So long story short, we got those back online, command module power came back up, uh, we went on into orbit. Um, and then we had to decide, what are we going to do now? Do we go to the moon or do we come home early? And um, I think the gutsiest call may have been that uh, after talking about it, we, we took a rev in Earth orbit to check things out. Uh, we did some tests on the gimbals that control the service module engine and back, which we had to have to get into lunar orbit and then had to have it to get out and head home. Uh, and those all worked. They all checked out. And we already had an entry to do anyway uh, to come back from Earth orbit. And I never will forget, Chris Kraft walked down and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, young, he called everybody young man. He said, young man, we don't have to go to the moon today. And I knew what he was saying because he was saying, it's your call, but don't feel pressure to. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the way Chris worked, and he, he, he said, it's your call. And uh, so after listening to everybody in the program office people and all that, finally said, let's go for TLI. And uh, you know, after translunar injection and they headed to the moon, that was one of the cleanest missions we ever had. It was almost flawless in terms of failures of equipment, pieces, and little things. Um, so we were feeling at the end of Apollo 12, um, in typical fighter pilot fashion with our scarf over the neck, we were, uh, we were feeling pretty uh, confident that uh, we could do just about anything. Remember, we were all very young. Uh, I was one of the older guys in the control center because I'd been in the Air Force for four years. And uh, when I was made a flight director on seven, I was 33. And, uh, so we were, I was one of the older guys. John Aaron that made that call was 26. Uh, and so we were, I don't think we were cocky, but we were confident and we thought we were pretty much bulletproof because we were too young to know. Then came Apollo 13. Um, and so we put, uh, ended up with a great start to Apollo 13. Uh, and then we had an incident 200,000 miles from home, about 40,000 miles from the, from the Earth, um, where we had an oxygen tank explode in the service module. And uh, Fred Hayes and, and uh, Jack Swigert and Jim Lovell uh, spent the next uh, several days with us in mission control uh, getting home. And uh, at first we thought, our first thought, I remember mission control. I wasn't there. I had actually gone off shift, turned the, my seat over to Gene Kranz, and I tell him to this day, I gave you a perfectly good spacecraft and you screwed it up. <laughs> uh, I went out and played it, was playing a softball game. And uh, they came out and got me and said, you better get back to the control, <coughs> control center. So when I first walked in, I still had all my sweats and ball cap and I thought they had some kind of little minor problem, but I, when I walked in, the room was calm, um, but there were some long faces. I knew we, I knew we had a serious problem. So uh, the oxygen tank, I won't go into the, maybe we'll get into the cause, but when it exploded, um, I guess all of them noticed what happened. Fred, tell us a little bit about what, what went on in those first few minutes. Uh, you knew an event had taken place of some kind, and uh, and eventually uh, we figured out what had happened. So, go ahead. Uh, 
I might, I might back up a, a just before the mission. Uh, we had, uh, I'll call it kind of an emotional uh, up and down. Uh, we had all been exposed to measles from uh, Charlie Duke, having been at a birthday party with his son. Charlie was my backup uh, at, at that mission. And uh, so as a result, uh, the, uh, the doctors, uh, every morning uh, that week, approach and launch, uh, we, they took blood samples. As I remember, I think they were shipped, uh, I think, to Cincinnati where there's the world's expert on measles uh, to, uh, to evaluate the blood. And uh, as, a re as a result, it came down that uh, Ken Manningly, who was a bachelor, uh, had never had measles as a child, was deemed to be highly susceptible that he would come down with measles during the flight. So uh, they made a crew change selection two and a half days before launch. Uh, Jack Schweigert, uh, filled in uh, for Ken, which kind of proved the concept. Basically, uh, I had trained for two previous backups, and uh, so we, we trained pretty much equally with the Prime. I certainly felt I could fly, have flown either of those missions uh, had I been called in to go fly, and that kind of proved it because Jack filled in and filled in amply. Ken Manningly, incidentally, I think is about a year and a half younger than me, and to date, he has never had measles. <laughs> right. Uh, right. But at any rate, uh, the second little incident that happened, uh, we, we suffered pogo on the uh, second stage and had an engine out, I think, a little over two minutes early on that stage. And that was the first kind of concern. Uh, crossed my mind that we're going to have enough fuel to get in orbit and still be able to have fuel left in the third stage to commit to go to the moon. But I think that was figured out pretty early that we had sufficient reserve. So we headed out on our way and we had a great uh, couple of days. And uh, when this uh, incident happened, uh, Jim Lovell and I had staged a TV show. Uh, and we kind of did a show and tell had pulled out things in the lunar module to talk about that we knew had not been discussed on, on previous missions as part of this TV show. And we were fixing to go to bed. Uh, that was that next morning, we're gonna go in the lunar orbit and get ready to go land. And that's when uh, Jack was asked to stir the cryos. And fr frankly, uh, you know, the, the movie gave kind of an argument about that. Uh, if I had not been putting away stuff in the limb, I would have been in the right couch and I would have thrown the switch to stir the cryo. So it Big had deal. nothing to do with Big deal. any, yeah. any con preconception you, you would have had as to what's up subsequently happened. Uh, just to go a little further, the, the explosion itself was just a big bang and echoing throughout this uh, metal structure. The vehicles are metal. A little bit of vehicle motion, some jets firing, uh, I guess the whole attitude. And when I drifted back up to the right couch position and looked, uh, instantly caught my eye was the caution and warning panel, which is about, about that size in the upper center of the panel, it has some red lights and some orange lights. Red ones mean something bad generally. And the orange <laughs> ones are something not right, but not quite as bad. And we had seven of those lights on, and we had a master alarm, big light, and a, a blue computer restart light. And that was uh, obviously immediately very confusing because they, they went across systems that were not interconnected in any way, which didn't make sense. Uh, scanning the panel with, uh, within a minute, I r realized that several of the meters looking at the cryos, the oxygen tank, two needles were in the bottom of the gauges. Different sensors, unlikely to have multiple sensor failures at one time. So I knew pretty much we lost tank two. My uh, sensation was just a sick feeling in my stomach because I knew without reference in mission rules, we weren't even going in the lunar orbit. We were gonna come home ASAP with an abort. So we'd lost the landing mission. Uh, it was not life-threatening because, uh, naively, 
I thought oxygen tank one was intact and we were going to just stay powered up, fully powered up and come home. And it took some time for things to evolve. Uh, uh, we did not do a good job of reporting what we saw out the window because I'm sure Jack and I know I, looking out the window, there was a sea of debris around us. And I did not report that and it wasn't until Jim noticed a very unusual stream going away from the window looking out the center uh, porthole that he uh, reported something going away from the spacecraft and I, I think Mission Control thought or was hoping that uh, what, what they were seeing with all these alarms was, uh, which also didn't make sense to them either, was an instrumentation problem and might even get fixed and oh, yeah. we'd, uh, <laughs> we'd continue on with the mission. But anyway, that's the way uh, things evolved. It was, it was a significant troubleshooting period. I was quite amazed uh, and impressed with the command module people uh, working through that. Uh, it was probably 25, 30 years later that I went and listened to uh, the inner loops in mission control, including to their side room experts. They had more brain power generally in a side room to mission control. And I'll call it, as a, it was professional arguing about what that we should try next, and they should suggest to try next to stop the leak in tank one. <clears throat> and uh, more on the basis of, uh, I guess, is a, th a theme that you don't want to take a step that you get backed into a corner and do something that would make things worse. Uh, at that time, Glenn Lunny was on duty. Yeah, at he the time, come. he had to replace Krantz's uh, shift. And uh, it got down to where we were starting to eat into the entry batteries. And, they, and I could tell from the inflection in the voices when they had run out of ideas. They just went sort of flat at that point. And Glenn uh, called them back to attention and said, we got to get this thing shut down because uh, we're eating into the entry batteries. And it just instantly the whole emotion changed. They were back in business, <coughs> uh, just like before. Uh, uh, but now wrestling with what's the order and sequence of how we shut this thing down? Because I think they're worried a little bit about maybe we don't want to damage anything. Because there was no procedure to shut it down. The command and service module had never meant to have, the mothership had never meant to be, ever be shut down in flight. And so I was, I was just really impressed with the job they did and working, working their way through that. Yeah, and then it took a, a long time to figure out how to power it up, and that, that was another issue that, that came later. You know, um, uh, the, uh, I think the thing that really impressed me during that entire time uh, was the professionalism that there, would, there was no panic. There were, and that came from training. We had the best training, hours and hours of simulation. And for its time, um, I can tell you, the astronauts would be in a simulator in one building in, on the Johnson Space Center. The control center would be powered up. We were connected, um, I suspect, by wires. There were no wireless systems in. Um, and to us, it looked like a real mission. And we would run days and days of simulations, every phase. I can remember running launch, Earth launch simulations and do 10, as many as 10 in one day. That was unusual. Uh, it was when we were really getting close, we wanted to get a lot of failures thrown at us and see if we could handle them. Um, but I was amazed at the training uh, and the the simulation fidelity for nine, for the 1960s and early 70s was amazing. It was really good. Uh, I know it must be light years better now. Uh, Walt, you wanted to make a point. Uh, I would like to say a word about uh, Jack Swigert. Uh, I doubt if very many people out here <coughs> know much about Jack. <coughs> Jack was in there in the command module pilot, and he was added to the prime crew two, just two days before, and for probably about 30 days before liftoff, he had the responsibility of getting everything ready for all the visitors and all that other kind of stuff. He was, he was not getting the kind of work that he had been all along. But Jack Swigert 
and I worked on the malfunction procedures back before, well, we were doing that for Apollo uh, 2, when we were on the crew of Apollo 2, and we worked a lot of those malfunction procedures out together, and then when I got focusing on just on uh, the mission and, and flying, uh, Jack was our support crew, and he continued to work on malfunction procedures, and uh, eventually ends up on the backup crew for 14. And I'll never forget that uh, I lived right across the, the street from uh, Johnson Space Center. And uh, I was there and the news came on and said that they had the explosion out there. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna find out what's happened. I drove over, went, sat in the back up of mission control, and when I was there, I think you were already starting to try to get the lunar module up. And I listened to Jack run down the checklist and go through all that kind of stuff, because I don't think anybody knew any more about the command module than, than Jack did. I went home, went to bed, went to sleep, because I knew that that crew, the entire crew, was doing everything they had to do. And I thought that I hope they have enough fuel to get back. So it's, we had different kind of attitudes about what, what went on in those days that I think that we probably do today. You know, it, it, a point that you're making there, I've, I've talked about quite a lot in the past, uh, a bit of serendipity because we, on the Apollo 13 mission, we probably had the most capable LMP, the lunar module pilot, was Fred Hayes, who had spent more time at Bethpage inside uh, lunar modules and doing the different kinds of things. And then we had Jack Swigert, who had done that. In fact, I worked with Jack some on those malfunction procedures. And it's, he spent hours at Downey in California, where the command service module is. So here we ended up uh, with this baggage of uh, bad stuff on Apollo 13, and we had probably the two best guys systems-wise that understood those space spacecraft better than, uh, than anybody else. And I, and I think I can say that uh, and, and be honest. And so uh, 13, we got them home. I gotta say one other thing. We, of course, for the next several days, uh, we were really monitoring consumables and in trajectory making, it, I won't go into it, we weren't on a free return when the accident happened. We had to do a little maneuver just to get them so that if we lost everything else, they'd at least go around the moon and be slingshotted back to Earth and land somewhere, uh, wherever it was. And uh, later we did some more maneuvering to put them in a good position in, uh, back in the Pacific. But um, the, the uh, attitude was, let's get them home, track the consumables very closely. And we, of course, we had some computers helping us doing all that. When uh, Fred got home, I don't know if you remember this, Fred, uh, with the flight control team, you shared your plots of, uh, all, he, had, he was plotting his own consumables by hand. And uh, you could have laid them on top of our, our uh, computer generated versions. So Fred was, Right on top, he knew exactly where all the, uh, we thought we'd run low on, probably on oxygen, it turned out we were damn near out of water uh, when we landed. I guess that was the most critical consumable because we weren't producing, we didn't have any fuel cells to produce any. So, well actually uh, the, mo the most critical, which I didn't even think of, was the lithium cartridges. Well, we were running out of lithium. It, it did not you? even occur to me as a consumable yeah. And that was the one that was the really the, we didn't have enough of those in the limb. Actually, our spares were down on the Mesa, which we were going to recover on an EVA. And even that wouldn't have been enough. So I, somehow I missed that. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, so we got them home. Hey, Jerry. Sure. Good, getting them home. Uh, we found, see, for that mission, I worked in a recovery operations control room just off the side there. That was... I, you know, I, I, and then I met the carrier when it got back to, back to Pearl Harbor for a transport back to the U.S. It was interesting during Apollo 13. Um, uh, so 
in that room we were collecting information from around the world on what might be available to assist us if we landed some goofy place or whatever. And, and I can't remember the name of the country on the western side of Africa, but this, this little country had one ship in its navy. <laughs> And they made sure that we got a Twix, got a te telegram into the control center from them um, saying that if we needed it, we could use it. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, uh, I want to leave some time for questions. And uh, so I'm going to kind of try to put an a, a end to our kind of formal piece of this, which has not been too formal. Um, obviously, after... 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 uh, were all uh, successful missions. We had problems in every one of them. But uh, those last three missions, particularly the, the J, we call them the J missions, is a block, uh, it's a J block of spacecraft, um, had a rover and really allowed us to um, go on into to, uh, uh, exploration in a way we had not been able to do uh, just on foot. Uh, I'll also say, and this is something I'm not sure I've discussed with the crew guys, but those last three missions, um, we focused on science, even in the control center. We had spent enough time, if, the fact going and landing on this foreign body had never been done, and we got it, we got comfortable with the transportation system. Those first few missions were all about transportation and do what science we could. And those last three missions were more, let's go explore with a system that we're confident in and, and confident that we can handle uh, failures. So there was a shift in those last three missions. And I think the scientists uh, have, that I've talked to, uh, particularly the lunar guys, have said that that those last three missions were really powerful in terms of science return. I want to give you guys, before we answer questions, just one thought from each of you about what Apollo, you think Apollo did for us, the country, et cetera. What do you think, what do you think it proved um, or disproved? I'll start with Milt to give. Recovery uh, guy gets to go first, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's see. I would say that the Apollo program showed um, what uh, we were capable of doing and today still are capable to do if people just get the hell out of our way. <laughs> Good. Fred? Well, I, I, I see it all the time as uh, just a program that was obviously uh, unique and uh, is, is in the, still in the minds of even very young. I, I speak to uh, school children. One just sent me an email. They have a project, something about uh, they're, they're going to apply for an, an, a state that would be a national project uh, that they wanted my help on. I talk to schools, a lot of Skype. I, I do Skype uh, with schools. i uh, done it with two years with a lady in Perth, Australia, a science teacher. Twice went to Italy. And of course, around the United States, it's very convenient. I don't travel. I just sit at my desk in the office and <laughs> do Skype. And they're still interested. I mean, I'm amazed. I mean, it's 50 years. And uh, so it stands out as a... Uh, uh, qu quite unique event to them and a, a great achievement and uh, I guess symbolic of uh, a tough thing you can do if you, uh, like you say, set your mind to it and the wrong people get out of the way and uh, let us move on. Well, I think that the attitude and the envir environment that we have today has changed a lot. I think the Apollo program showed that if you're willing to stick your necks out a little, you can accomplish a lot of things. And I'd like to see us philosophically get back to that today. Bill? Just 
trying to think but <laughs> things quickly here, but I think the thing that I will always remember how incredible it was that something like 400,000 people could work together for a common goal and not only accomplish that goal, but do it well. You know, and it was an incredible venture, an incredible adventure, and I'm so lucky to be in, have been involved. That, that is well said. I, Glenn Lunny, who is a flight director who couldn't join us uh, today, a colleague, a uh, close colleague, uh, put it in a way that I thought was interesting. said, the country gave us the keys and said, go to the moon. Uh, it's like giving a teenager the keys to the car and say, okay, it's yours, go do it. Um, I'm going to close my official piece of this and be thinking of questions, please, because we got, we, we've got some time. Um, Apollo 13. I said that we didn't, we weren't on a free return when the accident happened, when the tank blew. We put them on a free return with a small maneuver so they would go around the moon. Then we had some options. We could speed up the return. Uh, we could just stay like we were and take whatever we got. Uh, and there were two ways we could uh, actually speed up the return. We chose something we call PC plus two, Paracynthium plus two, P point of closest approach to the, to the moon. And two hours later, we did this maneuver. But we had these other options. And I never will forget, we went back, my team and Glenn's team have been the two teams that had worked on the different options because we had several hours there we could do that. And we went in to brief the, um, the NASA leadership. Tom Payne, who was the administrator, was there. Uh, Bob Gilruth, uh, Dick, Dick Slayton, Rocco Patron, Chris Kraft, uh, George Lowe. Uh, you were there, I think. Um, and so here are these two young guys, Lenny and me, uh, looking into the eyes of the leadership of the agency, and we briefed them on the options. And when we got to the end, Glenn and I had already been through it, we chose, we said, we prefer the PC plus two maneuver. Now, it sped the return up a day, got us to, the, to a good landing point. And I never will forget, looking into those, I think today we would have probably been questioned, why did you do that, why why did you do this, did you look at this option, blah, blah, blah. The room was silent and nothing happened. And then Tom Payne, the head of the agency, the administrator said, how can we help you? And that's all he said. We said, we got it, sir. And we turned around, went back and implemented it. That was leadership. In those days, we pushed decisions down. We didn't elevate them. Um, we pushed decisions down as low as they could be made by people who knew what they were doing rather than elevating it to headquarters, um, <laughs> uh, is all I can say. We, the responsibility, the people that knew what they were doing were given the reins uh, to operate. And that goes along with, with what Walt's saying about the attitude. We've got the brightest people in NASA today. They're a whole lot smarter than we were. Um, turn them loose push the decisions down, let them get involved, and turn them loose and let them go. It's also the difference between politics then and politics now. Yep. Okay. Uh, question in the back. So I'll, I'll throw the first grenade. Um, <laughs> every flight I've been on has had some measure of conflict either internally with the crew, and particularly between the crew and the ground, and most notably on the space station. We had a lot of instances where we had friction for things that happened that the ground wanted us to do that to us didn't make sense, or, I mean, you know, crewman's mail was on email. It was, it was dumped by somebody on the ground, and then there was some report about what really happened that wasn't truthful, 
And there was a lot of episodes like this. The crew got blamed for things that we didn't do to the ground, had done, but then said the crew did it. And these are real causes of friction, in a, particularly in a long duration mission. And uh, there was a sense of the crew versus, you know, the crew versus the ground, which in some manner is a good motivation because it made us extremely cohesive. But I'd like to ask the panel if you guys can talk about frictions like that between the crews and the ground or even among the crews while you were flying because my guess is it was there long before we flew and it probably started you know day one of the space program well i'm going to let walt address part of that because apollo 7 let me just say i think even apollo 7 uh the teamwork concept was still there and very strong um Seven was an exception because every other mission I was involved in in mission control, was, I was in all of Gemini and all of Apollo, never saw anything like any kind of confrontation. Now, we were short duration, you know. You know they, we were not staying for months. And I suspect, like anybody in a, an enclosed environment, it's going to be different. But, Walt, talk about Seven. Now, you're, I could talk about it, but I might say something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've lived with it ever since, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and I have to tell you that. Uh, and some of these people may not be. They, well, yeah, well, they happened. shared they shared it uh, up amongst the crew that was totally totally incorrect, but it doesn't make a difference. That's the difference between uh, uh, Wally Shira, who was our onboard commander. And he was a damn fine aviator and, and a good guy, incidentally. But when we got into orbit, uh, Wally was a, I think he was already a captain in the Navy. Yep. His uh, dad was an admiral in the Navy. His grandfather was an admiral in the Navy. And uh, in uh, Wally's mind, whoever's in charge of the ship, and ours was just a spacecraft, but whoever's in charge of the ship, is in charge regardless of what anybody else has, wants to do. If the admiral comes on board or what have you, if you're not in charge of that ship, that's what it is. So I think that it was a uh, uh, a bad, irritating kind of thing that went on. Uh, from on board, it didn't seem to, we, we didn't get quite as impressed with it, although we did get some, we had some internal disagreement on that too, as the ground did. Uh, but I, even to this, well, not to today, because Wally's been going about 10 years now, 10 I think. 10 years, 11. But even then, he would uh, uh, make the point that uh, what he wanted to do and say was the significant thing. And since he had a cold, uh, he was off on a, a different track than we were, we were, and he was trying to be supportive, too. I thought he did, uh, operationally, I thought he did a good job in spite of having a terrible cold. Don Isley never had a cold. He may have coughed the first day or so. I never had a cold uh, at the time. But uh, it, it, it was a bad thing because it changes the reputation of Apollo 7. And uh, I blame it kind of on, on, on the ground and in the flight control and their reaction to that, really. Yeah, it, it was a shock to us on the ground. I, I can tell you how it... It, um, all of us knew Wally. He was a great, as you say, full of humor. Probably the best pun teller I've ever known. He could make a pun out of anything. And he had flown earlier on Gemini. We never had any issue at all. And, um, but he, we, we, the crew was loaded, for one thing, and we loaded some more on him. Uh, in real time, and we just got a reaction out of him that that uh, stunned us. In the press, in those days, we had after every shift we had a post shift briefing. The flight director, you know, would usually bring somebody <coughs> along uh, with whatever had happened that day uh, or on, on that shift, and to brief the press. Well, the press jumped all over it because they could. The air to ground was released in real time. Wally told me later, after the flight, he didn't know that it was being released 
uh, and 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 but we had released air to ground since day one. <laughs> so anyhow, the uh, it it stunned us, but the, the press made a big deal of it. Uh, Glenn Lunny was the lead flight director, and Glenn was uh, Glenn was exercised. Let me say it that way. Um, I can remember in a post shift briefing, I told uh, Bill Hines from the Chicago Sun Times. He, I suspect Bill's gone now, but he was a irascible curmudgeon if there ever was one. And he got in. Well, you could, you know, you guys aren't in control, blah blah. blah. And I finally said, uh, Bill. I said, we're kind of like a football team. We all have our blocking assignments, and I can't block for the, if I'm a guard, I can't block for the tight end. So we just, we put our heads down and keep going, and we're, this is a team sport. Uh, we don't play with individuals. And he didn't ask any more questions. Now, whether that was a good answer or not, I don't know. Yeah. But it, it was an interesting point in our history, and then, no other flight did we have that. Well, yeah, I think it was an attitude between Wally and Ground. Uh, Performance-wise on board was okay, but some of the things didn't happen exactly. The Ground wanted to move the television up, and Wally with his cold didn't yeah. want to do that. We eventually got, and when we really got into that television part, instantly once a day we might be have 12 minutes, I think, something like that. Wally liked it. <laughs> oh, and he was great on TV. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question. Yeah, sort of, sort of building on that, if you <coughs> think about you had 11 days or 14 days, what if it had been four months? How much worse would it have been, and what would have been the techniques, or what, what would you have done if you had to spend four months in that somewhat finding ways to accommodate each other environment. There is no way that you would ever have had a command module for four months if you were something go on. It would, I don't think it would happen like that either because somebody would be over cold and they're back operating normally. And uh, so, and, and I think that was a contributing factor but not the total thing because it has to do with attitude and you know, who's in charge. And fighter pilots might have some of that kind of feeling time too. I don't know. What do you think? Okay. Uh, you yeah, I assume you're talking about crew relations. That. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you'd, uh, when you start talking very long term uh, in isolation, uh, that might, there may have been some more psychological things to consider. We were all of the kind of same ilk. We were all uh, military pilots. Uh, through the military trained, uh, we'd all been fighter pilots, so uh, basically amongst ourselves at least, uh, we were all kind of the same character, some a little more introverted or extroverted than one another, but basically the same backgrounds and experience. So I didn't, I didn't think there was any problem, and no matter which crew I'd ended up with, I think it would have been fine. Uh, I don't know about four months, four months would have been <laughs> Uh, just horrible in that confinement because uh, it, 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 wasn't, it, wasn't it wasn't very big. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> for that consideration, that, that's a different kind of trauma to have to deal with. Uh. Yeah, Mark? Uh, comment, Jerry. Uh, the importance of Apollo, which you brought up, I think history is going to show it changed us as human beings. Those images of the Earth taken from the moon, it has changed us, who we are. Seeing the Earth is so finite, no national borders, very thin atmosphere, so beautiful, our spaceship. And that's changed us as people, just like when we find life somewhere else, it'll change us as people too. Um, one other comment, Gene Cernan told me one time we were talking about Apollo and all of these experiences there. So it was amazing because it was somehow ripped out of the future and stuffed into the 1960s. And that's such a great <laughs> yeah. description of it, I think, to yeah. me. You know, Bill Anders says, we went to explore the moon and found the Earth. Yeah, no, that's very true. Uh, and ourselves in it, and ourselves, here. humanity in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that picture, the Earth rise on Apollo 8, uh, really grabbed everybody. Uh, question, back in the, oh. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about that culture of deferring to frontline expertise and, and in some of these most critical moments, asking the question and trusting the decisions of, if not the most junior m members of the team, some of the most junior members of the team. So what I'd like to ask is, 
how was that culture created and what would your advice be to organizations who are trying to create that culture today? Well, I, if I understand your question, I think one thing, we, what we did in Apollo had never been done. So we started with a clean sheet of paper. It was obviously very much grounded in the aviation, high speed aviation, high altitude aviation domain because that's all we had to go on. But because we had this clean sheet of paper and these young people uh, with older leadership in, in most areas, but we had a lot of, there was trust. I want to use the word trust from the beginning. There was tr we trusted the people above us. I can remember this. It's just like Tom Payne saying, how can we help you instead of trying to tell us what to do? We trusted the people above us. We trusted the people below us. And that happened at every level. We trusted the astronauts to, to, to do the right thing. I think they trusted us to make the right call. So I think the trust, it got into our DNA. Now we're back to a genome. Uh, uh, it just became a part of our DNA early um, because we were trying to create something that just hadn't been done. Um, but it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting thought. I, I think that same thing is going on at NASA today. I suspect too many decisions are being made at too high a level. I could see that before. And I bet George saw it when he was director at JSC. I saw it. Um, people kept wanting to, somehow they were smarter in Washington, D.C. than any of the field centers. And that's crazy. Um, Jerry, you know, um, Jerry? Where are you? I'm right here. Oh, <laughs> I was like, up. I, I was just going to add something. <laughs> the old recovery guy, going to get his lick. Uh, I, um, you mentioned it earlier. One of the things I think that really allowed us to, to do what we did, and it, the, the training was unbelievable. The yep. commitment to training and the, and the commitment to command and control. I'm, I'm, I'm talking the environment mainly from the inside mission control. Yeah. What the neatest thing was is in that room, I, I as a flight director, I was in charge. Amen. I was in charge, and I was given that, and I was surrounded by people who knew what the hell they were doing, and we trained so much, we covered so much ground that we were really very good at what we did, and a little bit of cocky at times, but we, and, yeah. and, and we were in the environment to where we were given a job to do and allowed, allowed to do it. That simple, Paul. <clears throat> well, maybe I can say a word or two here about the difference <clears throat> between uh, communications, photography, things like that, that now that you look, you've, they've had millions of, of photos, I swear, coming back from the, from the space station. But what you, what you don't know unless you've read something about it, air-to-ground communications for our mission, the, the only time it can have communications with the ground, thank God, was uh, about 5% of the time. Uh, we didn't have uh, spacecraft up there that to pass on all this, and 5% of the time. And occasionally that would kind of interfere with something else we were trying to do. But uh, when you start talking about photography, now that I've, I've never seen such great pictures and they've got great cameras and all kinds of stuff. Back in those days, we had, you know, a couple of Hasselblads, uh, one, uh, one lens, uh, had enough film for, I, th I think about, f on our mission, about 540 uh, pictures. We actually screwed up 40 of those, but uh, <laughs> we had enough film for that. But you're sitting here, the, the windows that we had, for example, you had to take the pictures out the window. We had five windows, but they're almost all in the same, uh, pattern, 150 degrees is what it covered. You're in a spacecraft that has to drift. You didn't have fuel, uh, enough uh, RCS fuel to hold a position there all the time. Occasionally you might have to do that if you had an objective to do it for. 
so you're drifting you're pointing out if you look at the earth down here and out there you're pointing out most of the time uh, you're going around the earth in 90 minutes every 45 minutes it goes dark and so if you happen to have all the windows point someplace and you do all that kind of stuff you have time it's dark the ground that remember they asked us they said don't take pictures uh until five minutes you know within five minutes of of the darkness and we didn't follow that one too well because occasionally we got a chance to see something uh the uh just just trying to take the pictures out there if you're looking if let's say you're lucky and you had those windows and you're looking down at the ground 55 percent of the earth's surface yeah. surface is covered with clouds so for example i can remember in our mission they said uh, please don't take any pictures of china well i'm sure that was a political decision but didn't have to worry about it never once did we see the, the chinese surface it was always covered with house not once did we ever see the chinese surface so you, you had that that kind of thing going on what there was one other point of very seeing oh yes the windows we had five windows the best one was in the hatch. It was about 10 inches across. And that consisted of two three-quarter inch thick quartz uh, glasses separated a very tiny little bit. And whatever they glued them in with, at least for Apollo 7 and 8, they, got, they would outgas up there. So by, by about the third day, the best window had all kinds of fluids, looked like, in between those two panes. You couldn't take a picture out of there. Uh, they were all, all deteriorating. Fortunately, my window, which was not all that big, but it was the last one to fail, and it was failing like towards the end of the mission. So I got to take quite a, few, quite a few of the pictures. If you were lucky enough for all those other things to come together, but you've got to realize it's a totally different world than what you have today, which is much better for picture taking. Uh, <laughs> yes. Question: uh, You got the mic? Go ahead, right here. I think you're hot. Yeah, is it on? Um, thank you so much for your service. Uh, I wanted to ask, as the space program evolves, what would be your recommendations to the education and training of young flight surgeons? Hmm. Flight surgeons. <laughs> Bill, do you want to take a crack at that one? No, I said, I said, Bill. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I said, Bill. Oh, B I L. -L. You know, we're all getting old, yeah. and we can't hear, <laughs> and we can't see, and. Uh, <laughs> they've, got, they've got a lot of them flying. A lot of them flying. Right. You know, back in my day, everything was new, uh, so. I, I got to do a lot of things. Yes, you know, because how I got to do all, a lot of things is because I was the only flight surgeon during the Gemini program that was willing to jump out of the helicopter with the underwater demolition team so that I could be there if, in case any astronaut needed any medical attention yeah, because yeah. there was a significant concern because it was after Gemini. I, after Mercury, but before Gemini started, and Gemini was programmed to do incremental flights from three orbits to four days, to eight days, to 14 days. And the last Mercury flight, Gordon Cooper almost fainted when he came out of the spacecraft. So there was concern about, you know, were, were they be able to get out of the spacecraft? And so I had, I said, I'll there. take on this job. So I trained with the UDT team. We practiced out in the Gulf. You know, we, I, we could do cardiopulmonary resuscitation, a pliable life raft in six foot seas. You know, so we could do all this kind of stuff. And somebody asked me about training, you know, and the only advice I can think of right now is never give up the opportunity to learn anything because it will be useful forever in your life. And you know, the other thing is, we have flight surgeons that fly now, too. Yeah, well, so when I, uh, I volunteered to do this, to be able to jump out of the helicopter with UDT team, and, uh, 
they said, you know, you got the job. However, the US Navy said, hold on a minute. You know, you're going to send a civilian out to an aircraft carrier to work with this elite group of, of sailors, and, and we're supposed to accept this without any training? You know, no, no, can't. And a Canadian? No. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, they said, he has to be trained. So my boss came and said, you got to get trained. So I said, OK, let's get trained. So he <laughs> called the Coast Guard down in Galveston and said, we got a young flight surgeon that at least uh, learned to jump out of a helicopter. Can you take him out over the Gulf and NASA will pay for it? Okay. So I went down there all by myself without any flotation gear. And before I left, one of the, the military flight surgeons said to me, he was an Army flight surgeon, gosh sake, he said, do you know that these guys jump out go at, you know, about 20 to 40 feet in the air going 40 knots? Are you willing to do that? And I said, if they do it, that's what I'll do. What the heck? So I got down to Galveston, and, and uh, <clears throat> the commander of the helicopter said, what is it you want to do? And I said, I just have to say that I, am, I have jumped out of a helicopter at 40 feet going 40 knots. And he said, you want to do what? You know? <laughs> so, so I said, look, this is what the UDT guys do. This is what I got to do. He says, you can't do that. I can't, I can't handle this. And I said, I have got to do this. So we went out over the Gulf and took me up at 10 feet at 5 to 10 knots, and I jumped out, and they hoisted me up in the, in the horse collar. So then we went to 20 feet at 10 knots, you know, and 25 feet at 15 knots, and I was getting to hit pretty hard. So I said, you know, let's just do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so up we go at 40 feet, and he wouldn't tell me how fast he was going, but I jumped out. I hit with a pretty good whack but I didn't die. <laughs> so, so I went out to the aircraft carrier and met the UDT team. And the, any one of these guys was big enough to pick me up under one arm and carry me across the deck. And, uh, and he, the officer looked down at me and he said, have you ever jumped out of a helicopter before? And I said, yeah, I went out at 40 feet at 40 knots. And he said, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> I was 28 years old by that time. These guys were all 20, 21, 19. So not only did they have an old guy to look after, he was probably demented. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're out of time, George. But uh, it, are we OK? OK. Question in the back. Yeah. Thanks. This, this may be a, a rare opportunity when we have the landing and recovery guy, the flight director, and the astronaut to settle a point that was raised in the movie Apollo 13. What happened during that long blackout during reentry? Why was it so much longer than expected, or was it? You know, Jim Lovell says that was intentional because he thought it might make a good movie. Uh, uh, actually, we don't know. Um, the first contact was to be with one of those Araya aircraft. Um, and um, it's possible that atmospherics got to us, or, um, or it could have been a switch in a wrong position uh, in the aircraft. And uh, I can tell you, on the ground, it was the quiet, one of the quietest moments, I think, ever in mission control. Uh, because we kept a countdown clock that uh, we always set a clock for the beginning of blackout and the end of blackout. And they would both count down. And just like that, the comm would come up or go off in the beginning blackout. And when it got to the end, and Joe Kerwin was the Capcom, and he followed 13 this Houston, nothing. You could have heard a pin drop in a mission control center. And nobody said anything. Everybody just kind of kept, didn't even look at each other, just kind of staring forward. And I know I was thinking, son of a something gun, um, that thing got the heat shield uh, when it blew the O2 tank, and uh, they didn't make it in. And, uh, but nobody said anything. And Joe Kerman, about every, I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute with Apollo 13 is Houston, silence. And finally, he made a call, and we were all about to, I, I know, I. I was almost certain that they didn't make it in. Um, he calls, and I think it was Swigert said, Oh, Houston, it's Apollo 13. Everything going great here. And we all went, oh. you know, 
almost collapsed. Um, and about that time, we saw the chutes off of a camera that was on the, on the uh, carrier. Uh, so we, we um, to this day, don't know why the comm didn't. They were obviously through. Um, everything was configured correctly on the ground. We did go back and verify that, except the airplane was the, the only thing we never really did get a good feel for. So I suspect it was that or something atmospheric or something. It, you know, those, the comm, as Walt was saying, um, back in the old days, it wasn't nearly as good as we have today with satellite communications and that sort of thing. Um, it was, in fact, I'm kind of amazed it worked as well as it did. And uh, another question, anybody? I have a question for Mr. Hayes. I was wondering if you'd be willing to tell us a little bit more about the illness that you developed on Apollo 13. Uh, yeah, what I, what I had was a lower urinary tract infection. Uh, and it was a, kind of a dumb thing. Uh, <clears throat> we got to a point, uh, and I think it was really miscommunication. We didn't understand correctly uh, a couple of days, a uh, day and a half out where we were asked to, uh, to not dump urine any further, uh, which we were, uh, using an alternate, alternate means, we were actually d dumping it through the hatch because we weren't about freezing on the uh, other normal receptor. And, and uh, we rigged up a, a jury rigged, uh, like one we used a bag that normally would collect water when you refill the backpack and had a bunch of hoses hooked up to go in there. One of the alternates on board we had were these little Gemini bags. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, just, I was lazy, and I decided uh, this is a set of prophylactic you put on to this little bag, and it was easier to drain out of that, and I just left it on. And uh, obviously uh, there's a check valve, and part of my urine wasn't getting through the check valve, so I was sitting bathed in my own urine for a better part of a, a day. And I think I'd, whatever bugs lay around uh, in the vehicle, uh, managed to get into my urinary tract. And so I s started feeling uh, chills and fever, typical of, uh, and uh, of course, started burning when I went to the bathroom. So anyway, I, that's uh, what happened, how I, how I got contracted that. Obviously, the other, Jack and Jim were smarter than I, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't end up with that problem. You know, there was a reason for us to request that they not do the dump, which vented uh, out, and it actually produced a little propulsion. <coughs> and we were having trouble keeping the space, the entry corridor uh, when you're coming back from the moon is very shallow. It's only, what, two and a half, three degrees, two and a half degrees, I think, a uh, cone that you've got to hit. If you're high, you'll skip out and go in orbit around somewhere for the rest of your life. Or if you're too deep, you'll, you'll auger in and get too hot. And uh, so you've got to hit that car carter. We knew, finally figured out that when the oxygen tank um, blue and that it vented out the side of the spacecraft there was still a little venting even days later going on so we knew that was pushing us a little bit so we kept doing these little mid-course corrections to get us back into the corridor and finally about a day to go we said if you can you know don't dump anymore if you don't i think we intended don't dump anymore if you got some place to put it uh, just to keep any propulsive forces off of the uh, spacecraft. <sighs> I think we've run out of questions. George, this is probably a good time. Oh, got one. This, they say that the uh, the reason that uh, you know tank blew up was due to the uh, you know wrong uh, you know circuit breaker, but uh, it, it worked as the uh, last measure. The, I did some reading, and somebody wrote that the, uh, when the, uh, on the manufacturer phase, 
uh, somebody is uh, transferring the uh, that uh, tank number two on the cart or something. It bumped to something and it dropped on the uh, ground, and that skewed some the uh, some of the piping inside. That was the the uh, root reason. Was uh, somebody's uh, you know theory and uh, what what's Here. the uh, you know view? Here's what our, Fred, you, you probably got the whole history of that O2 tank. Um, it was overheated. For, Fred, just tell them about it. And, yeah, the, the uh, incident dropped. I think you're referring to was at uh, Downey at Rockwell. Uh, we had uh, they discovered EMI problems, and they were going to do some uh, modifications in the uh, cryogenic tanks. And they were all all going to be removed and shipped to beach. And and also as as a part of the fix, they were going to be made compatible with Kennedy ground power, which was at 67 volts, I think, where spacecraft main bus was 28 volts plus or minus two. And uh, the tank actually that we ended up with actually had been pulled out of Apollo 10's command and service module. This is like over a year before the launch. What you're talking about is that when they were taking it out of that spacecraft, they, they undid all the attached bolts except one caught up or something and they dropped it, but only not very far, I think a foot or less in that bay as they pulled it out. And the pipe you're talking about probably got offset was a pipe that went through the tank that was used on the ground to run gaseous nitrogen through at room temperature roughly and boil off the oxygen. So it's more for ground servicing. And, uh, but in, and also in the process of the uh, modifications to the higher power, at Kennedy they changed out all the components except thermostats, the little things that would cycle at certain temperature pressure. And so what happened in flight when uh, that sort of cryo was done, it, uh, welded the contactors shut so it could not cycle and that's what eventually led to the problem. I'll, I'll have to say I'm amazed uh, thinking of the times uh, all the all the configuration control uh, upkeep of the individual parts lots of them where it's done manually paper paper uh, not today you know you got computer systems that track that kind of stuff and if you make a mod that normally, normally is uh, approved, multiple approved uh, for change. That ripples in the training documents, it ripples in the maintenance documents uh, with the computer system. I mean, that, that did not exist at that day and age. So I'm amazed that uh, it speaks well <clears throat> of the diligence and attention paid by people that we didn't have more of maybe that kind of thing happening. Because uh, it was all paper reams and reams of paper okay i think uh it's noon uh one minute after thanks for your attention and uh that's hope you got a glimpse of apollo at 50. thank you <laughs>